and yet now your son is also a bass player, so we've got multiple generations in your family, too. It's a genetic problem in the Famasiadri family. <laughs> <laughs> It is my pleasure to bring you this conversation with Milton Mashadri. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting with University of Georgia bass professor Milton Mashadri, who is a UNESCO artist for peace. That's wild. By age 17, in fact, he was co-principal bassist of the Porto Alegre Symphony in Brazil. And at 19, he was already on the faculty at Brazil's Federal University. And we (laughs) dig into this and so many other topics. You're really going to enjoy this conversation. He has this beautiful t- story. We get into the story of that bass. Milton's work with Petraki and so many other great artists over the years. Some of his favorite Brazilian and Argentinian composers. What he does with his bass festival at the University of Georgia. So many great takeaways. Thank you for listening. I know you're going to love this. We've got some great sponsors for today's episode, Diderio Strings, Upton Bass, and the Bass Violin Shop. More on them later. But let's dive in with our conversation with Milton and some excerpts from his album from 2014, Vocalies. University of Georgia for not quite 30 years or around 30 years? Right around 30 years. Yeah, yeah, 30 years. I've been here, uh, I'm a full professor here and distinguished full professor. They, I'm a, what they call the university professor, the only one in the arts with that title. I think also, didn't I see you've got a Leonardo da Vinci Award of Arts, isn't that? Did I see that? Last year, yeah. The, that, that, was, that was a nice surprise for me. I mean, I got nominated, and when I saw what it entitled, I said, oh, sure. <laughs> and, and then forgot about it, and then I got a call when I was in Italy. And I was in Genova, actually, with a bunch of students uh, walking downtown when I got a call from Finland, saying, oh, that I won the Leonardo da Vinci. First musician to, to win it since they started the impact you've had, you know, in the bass world in so many different ways. And, and I love that. Uh, I would, you know, you came over and studied with Gary Carr and I, and, and he had the, I don't remember how many generations of bass players are in his family, but it's multiple, right? He's a third or fourth or fifth generation bass player. If I remember correctly, there was like seven, he's the wow. seventh generation of, of or bass player in the family. I don't know if, on a, in a row, but cousins and some other people there. Well, and you're the third generation, I think, in your, and now your son is also a bass player, so we've got multiple generations in your family, too. It's a genetic problem in the Famasiadri family. <laughs> <laughs> we, my grandfather, when he came from Italy to South America, was a bass player, and my father, so follow the steps. I guess their wishes, but follow their steps. <laughs> Against their wishes, though, really. Well, my father tried to dissuade me from playing bass because he knew how large it is, lack of this, all these problems, play any other instrument but bass, and he couldn't convince me. The more he said no, the more I wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so so was bass, did bass end up being your first instrument, or did you start on piano or violin before that? Or? So I started with the cello when I was eight years old, and uh, when my family moved from Uruguay to Brazil, then I started with the bass with my father. I convinced him. Started practicing behind his back, the bass. And then one day I showed him, hey, Dad, look, I can play the bass. And obviously everything was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so then he decided to teach me. It's remarkable, like, how, how, I mean, you were a teenager and you already had all these amazing, I mean, you're co-principal bass in Porto Alegre, right? And you were teaching at the, at the Federal University before you were 20. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. I, I, you must be one of the few to have a position like that ever at well, that age. I guess, that, I guess that because being exposed so early and I won the, uh, the placement in the, the symphony orchestra at 17, so... After that, I gave me the invitation to teach at the university, and I, I didn't enjoy it. That's what my first taste of academia, and uh, I'm play, I was playing the Camerata of the university at the time, and I enjoyed that part. So when 
the University of Georgia came to, uh, along and decided to take it. It was uh, either an option coming to Georgia, going back to Brazil, or going to Japan to play in a chamber orchestra. Georgia, Georgia won. Wow. <laughs> Talk about three, three <laughs> re- remarkably different places uh, in the world. Interesting paths. Yeah, but then the, the academia gives us the freedom to continue performing their solo or orchestra, and so many other things. There's a lot of beautiful freedom and teaching yeah. uh, that allows you to continue with so many parts of phases of the bass. I'd love to know what it was what it was like because you know I had a just a part time academia job when I was about twenty three twenty four and I felt strange teaching people that are like twenty seven twenty eight here you were at nineteen and um, all of your students certainly were older than you <laughs> right except for when I got my first teaching job except for one everybody was older so I had a beer for about thirteen years <laughs> that's <a bit> older. <laughs> Uh, I actually, when my first son was born, that's when I shaved my beer off. You have to play the, the, the game, and when all your students are older than you are, you have to kind of show respect, you know. Then you came and, and studied with Gary Carr, and I mean, you had what, what a lot of people would think. You already had this, you know, flourishing career in Brazil. Uh, what, what made you decide to come? I mean, obviously, what a great artist to spend time with him, but w- was that a hard decision at all to come and, and study with Gary? Uh, look, it was uh, an interesting, I was uh, not happy in just uh, remaining teaching at the university and I wanted to progress some more. I knew I could go farther. Uh, so when the option and invitation came to study with Gary, uh, I took it. It was a hard decision to resign from the university, but it was a full-time job. But uh, I thought it was, at the time, I was 21, so I said, I, if I'm going to do it, this is the time to do it. Next up, we dig into takeaways that Milton has from his time working with Gary Carr. You're going to get so much out of this. I know you'll love it. And before we dive in, I'd like to give a shout out to Diderio Strings and let you know about their Zyx Strings. And here's a little bit about that line of strings, which is a very cool line and a little bit different than the other Diderio Strings. This is Orchestral Strings Product Manager Lyris Hung on Zyx Strings. Zyx is our only synthetic string for bass at the moment, and that is made with a peak core. Uh, it's actually called Zyx, it's a Zyx core, and that, for those uh, strings, you'll notice they're slightly thicker in diameter, the Zyx, than, say, the Kaplan or the Helicore, um, and primarily a product of the synthetic core being lower mass, so because it's lower mass, it needs more of it, <laughs> and so, so we use, a, you know, kind of a big bundle of that fiber for the core, and then we wind with higher mass materials on the outside. Learn more at controversyconversations.com slash strings. All right, back to our conversation with Milton Mashadri and his experiences working with Gary Carr. What was it like studying with him when once you got to the States? Were you going through vomit exercises for a couple hours a day? Uh, what, what was that whole experience like for you? <laughs> In the, well, it's the first recording, my father it was the one who made me hear the first recording of Gary. So I wish I could play like that. That would be, that would be fun. And then one thing led to the other to come, but I th- I believe I was either the first one, first student from Latin America that he had. It was a very international class. I mean, we were 14, I believe, and I think that we the two or three were Americans. Everybody was from Europe. I, I was the only one coming from South America at the time. But it, it was fascinating. It was a very intense class, not only starting with him, but being surrounded by all these other bass players, and Steve was just at the same time with me studying, and so he was his uh, one of his assistants at the time, and he was fun to be around too. I, I'm I'm sure, yeah. And what a player! I've had him on the podcast before. Great guy, and uh, yeah, it's it's just remarkable. I remember chatting with Diana Gannett also about like you know work. She was his assistant for a period of time too, and teaching with him. 
Yeah, I believe she was before I came to the U.S. The one who was with me there at the last semester when I was about to finish was Debbie Murray. Okay. Yeah. He came as KCA too at the time. But uh, right from there, I came directly to Georgia. I'd, I'd love to know, like, what, uh, obviously, like, we think of Gary Carr and we think of, I mean, well, like, what a player and the sound and the, 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 uh, the first thing I think of just in terms of technique is his vomit exercises, right? Which I know he's, he said to me, too, are really more of a right hand exercise than a left hand. And I remember talking to Alex Ritter about what he's incorporated in his own teaching, and he's really into belay and the, using the third finger in different contexts. And I'd love to know, like, what's your technique um, sort of mix look like? Like, are you are you using what you learned from Gary Carr, or using some belay or other p- Petraki? What what do you use on a regular basis with your students? I am a mixture of Italian school with American school with. Uh, everything that I, I use the third finger, but I am the only one in my studio. All my students use the second finger, except for the Alex and a few others that came along from South America. I didn't change them. They were working fine, but most of my students that I come usually play with the second finger, except for my son. <laughs> he's a third finger player, although he's a finance major at the university, so <laughs> he... I don't know how much he would go into the bass career. He plays in the symphony with me, too, but we have a good time. But uh, everything was forged into playing, seeing Gary playing all the, all those exercises that he saw. I work a lot, also played a lot of duos with Petraki, played in Italy. Petraki has been here in Georgia many times, and I've saw some of his uh, teaching, too, some of his uh, playing with them. Uh, live is a, is a learning experience. So you try to you incorporate as, as you see how things work into your teaching. And you know, when you teach also, every student has a different problem. They all come with all different issues. So you, you're kind of a doctor. You try to give different medicines to correct different problems. And it's fun. It's fun that way. Well, it's, it's so great that you brought Petraki over, and what a, what a he's so, he's one of those people in the bass world I've never had the chance to meet in person, but I've been you know I've listened to him countless times, and I've used his method for myself and with students. Uh, when did you first meet Petraki? Uh, well, I, I met him in Italy in the early nineties, and then he came to my bass symposium maybe three or four times, and we played many times together, staying in his house several times in, in Rome, and we became good friends, but he, uh, I'm always fascinated with his left hand, very methodical, very studied and articulated. It's, it's not so loose as Gary's, for example, left hand. And so it's, it's an, a nice ensemblage of both hands that I, I tend to use. It's fascinating. It's great that you combine those two approaches because I think I think of those as very very separate kind of approaches, right? <laughs> very different approaches, very different. So it's it's interesting how you absorb from each one of them uh, what can work and got, adapt better to your own technique. And several of my students have gone along uh, to adapt a, a technique from other professors. Alex did the bachelor with me and and came back for the doctorate and in the meantime he was teaching at the University of Brazil. Marcos, for example, did a bachelor's and a master's and then went on to say a doctor and then I know he's a very big user of Rabat technique now. So those, uh, for example, just to cite a couple of examples. Although half of the professors and universities in Brazil are my former students. <laughs> <laughs> And then they're spread all over the place, Europe and you know, many other countries. It's, it's fun to see. Sometimes it's good to visit them. I, I'm sure. I mean, what it's it's so cool to see your your name comes up time and time again with with students all over all over the the Americas and and in Europe too. And it's just cool to see all these different points of intersection you've had with all these different players. And I just, I love that you've been, like I said earlier, you've been a point of entry, I think, for a lot of people from Latin America into the United States. And, you know, I was talking with Alex about this when I interviewed him back, back a while ago. And 
like what's is it is the adjustment difficult for students at all coming from let's say maybe Brazil to Georgia I mean I'm sure that they must have several other uh, people from from their country around so maybe it's gradual but what like what's a are there any challenges that people have just adjusting to life in the United States uh, not so much it depends it depends where the student come from uh, Central America or South America you know the south of South America is very European so uh, those students really don't have much of an issue adapting and Brazil has a has the one of the Latin American countries who blended more with the U.S. in many ways. If you see Argentina or Uruguay, they're very European countries, very focused into the school. is still looks to Germany, Italy, France, much more. Brazil looks more towards the U.S. in many ways. Uh, so it's fascinating how each one of them adapt. And then uh, all over the world, it's like that. I mean, I mean uh, you know, since 98, I've been working with UNESCO as an artist for peace. So traveling with them also shows you how taking me to Asia. And I work with a lot of students in Asia and, and Australia and many other places. And it's fascinating to see how they adapt to the, once they come to the United States, how they adapt. Usually music is very quickly. Some other degrees might be more difficult. You know, I was just at the Bradisage competition down in, in Texas, and I think it was, it was quite fun. <laughs> it was a lot, and talk about it, I was so glad that I wasn't up there performing myself. <laughs> I got to just watch and take it all in. But boy, what, how far the base has come. That's what I kept on thinking, you know. It's fascinating, and I think that the guy who started the whole thing was Gary in many ways. Mm-hmm. In many ways. But it's amazing how much from those 1960s, 40s, 50s, how they come out a long, long way. Fascinating. The bass has changed a lot during the last 30 years. I like to describe the bass revolution that's going on all around us. And Milton has been a part of that and has some great thoughts and perspectives on how the bass has changed, both in the United States and Brazil and internationally. Before we dig into this final part of our conversation, I'd like to thank Upton Bass and share this story with Broadway bassist David White about how he came to own his Upton Bass. I have to mention Upton Bass in Connecticut because those guys have really bailed me out and Eric specifically has become a good friend. He's a very, very nice guy. The story of my upright is my grandmother, who I was very close with, passed away before my senior year of high school. And she was always a very big supporter of me playing and uh, she always came to every concert, was the loudest cheerleader. Anyway, when she passed away, she was kind enough to leave money for me to be able to purchase a professional instrument. And for a long time, I had been looking around, trying to find some stuff. And I said, you know, I, I really like these vintage instruments, but, you know, I didn't want to spend 30, 40 grand on something that I just kind of liked. So just kind of searching, I stumbled upon Upton and I said, you know what, I think I want to get a new instrument built, something to my specifications. And it was also very an, an, an intensely personal process for me because of, because of the history with my grandmother. Anyway, I went to them and they bent over backwards to make this beautiful 7 eighths bass. And I had gotten it and I was playing a tour of Guys and Dolls and I set it on a chair and my foot got caught in a cable and down she went and I cracked Mm -hmm. off the entire scroll. Now, the funny thing was I happened to be in New London, Connecticut, which is about six miles down the road from their shop. So uh, Dave, who runs their website, ran over, gave me a rental base, took my my damaged base, went away with it. 
and uh, fixed it up. Learn more at UptonBass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Thank you also to The Bass Violin Shop for providing the hosting for Contrabass Conversations. And if you are looking for a new bass, a new bow, a rental bass, or a repair or restoration, they're a great place to look. They're located in North Carolina, and you can learn more on their wonderful website. By the way, they have a great website, BassViolinShop.com. All right, back to our conversation with Milton about how much and in what ways the bass has changed during these last 30 years. Well, and even since you've been active, I mean, you do, you 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 tour the world, you play upwards of 40, 50 dates a year, probably at least solo-wise, right? So you've been a part of this too and seeing this change. Like, how have things changed it just since you've been active as a solo bassist what what are some of your observations been over the past couple of decades like maybe starting out with gary to like where where you are now well it's uh, you can almost touch the development of the bass in many countries where you used to really not find bass players at all with very elementary schools but they have taught stop with the orchestra, half of the neck, and basically good players, but not really pushing much forward into the repertoire to now the new generation is fantastic all over the world. I just was in Colombia in the first, and I was not surprised. I met, I was in Colombia maybe 30 years ago before, and boy, the school have changed over there too. For example, just to cite an example. Argentina I have followed for many, many years, Chile, Brazil, Italy, Asia too, those independent countries from, from Russia too, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, players coming out of those places too. Fascinating. Fascinating. It's developing big time. And you, I, I saw some of the videos of the Bradetis competition. I was very impressed with those guys. And also the Sydney competition recently. Yeah, and just the diversity of programming and that the compositions, and I know you've been involved, you involved a lot in commissioning new works for the bass and finding new works, and especially like promoting works from uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, South American, Latin American composers. Yeah, because the the there is a most of the bass players like transcriptions, and they have disseminated works from European composers and American composers, but very few have done from Latin America. We just recorded another CD last year with uh, with Latin American composers. I think there's some good material there to show. Well, and I'll be sure to, I can I can include a few excerpts of some of that, you know, for people to listen to. Like if, if uh, and I always love discovering new composers, like who are some of your favorite Latin American composers that people might not be familiar with. Like we all know Piazzolla, obviously, you know, but who are some people that people should be checking out these days? Well, there are composers in, in Brazil who are actor uh, composing for the bass and nice stuff. Vilani uh, uh, Cortez, I recorded a few of his pieces, but he he has a whole array of, of new works. We just did a, a whole recital of guitar and bass repertoire that he wrote. Very, very nice. And um, they, are, they are, obviously, the Villa Lobos, there are some transcri- transcriptions that are just beautiful. And Enrique Oswald, uh, in Argentina, the, those uh, pieces by Guastavino, they're great pieces to trans- transcribe. Amato, which was a big teacher in Argentina, wrote quite a few cute pieces for the bass, too, that are very nice to listen to. I mean, there, there, there's a bunch of sources that, if you start digging, you can you can find them. I, I have an, uh, an edition that I printed in Italy. We did a transcription, uh, an edition that uh, Limor sometimes carries the book. Uh, that's pieces from South America, from composer in Rio. That is very nice. Parpinelli, who wrote some cute pieces for the bass too. But it's it's like some good stuff there that people should know, get to see them, and listen to them. Well, you know, I was also noticing at this Bradford competition, it was it was really fascinating to see how people put programs together. And for the first round, they were shorter programs, but for the second round, they were forty five minute programs. And and it just got me thinking a lot about programming in general. And and you do all these concerts, and you must be thinking about programming all the time. Like, what? How do you go about constructing a program? to 
and especially your work with UNESCO, like maybe to draw people into the world of the bass to like, this is this cool instrument. Maybe they've never heard it before. Like, how do you think about putting a program together? Well, is when you go on tour and you see where you're going to play, it's very important to judge the, the temperature, let's put it this way, where, you, where you're going to be either short pieces or longer pieces or uh, big sonatas or concertos or or also I'm a strong believer sometimes that you have to give the audience some kind of suite to entice them in the future for another bass player who follows your way follow behind you they will be happy to listen to and and come oh a bass recital sure I will have fun to do that. and they come uh, when I just was started, there were some people playing repertoire that was academically very interesting, but not very appealing for audiences. And we followed the path of some, some uh, basses that, oh no, we just heard this bass. No, please, if you do that, hit the bass or kick the instrument or make funny noises. No, we don't want to hear that. No, 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 bass can be something different than that. So following Gary's step, for example, was very easy. People who have heard Gary play, very happy to listen to another bassist coming along. Not many other ways happen the other way too, but, <laughs> but it's, uh, it, you try to sense what you're going to do. See, if you're playing just for, I have done many performances at, at, at the United Nations in New York, and when you play for uh, all those ambassadors, you don't, you don't go with heavy stuff, you show them maybe some virtuosic pieces, bonbons, sweets, and things of that sort. <laughs> on the pitch. you have to judge who you're going to play him for. I like that. I like that phrase. Like, take the temperature and see. You know, <laughs> well, you see what you're going to be. What type of audience is going to be in front of you, and then you judge your repertoire. If you follow with the same pianist, we, we have a lot of baggage together. Then it's very easy to to put the programs together. It, I know it must be a pain in the neck carrying that testori around the world, but like, what a sound. And, you know, I hear you play. I mean, that's just that, I, that's one of those sounds that you just can't, can't help but fall in love with. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a magnificent instrument. I love, uh, when you, the, it's the instrument that when you demand from it, it gives to you. You push even harder and it still carries through. Many times you play in basses that you, it goes up to here, on, and they said, no, no, that's it, no more. Don't ask for more. This is what I can give you. <laughs> the, the story, sometimes you push it and it keeps going, and it's fascinating, principally in big concert halls. Oh, I yeah. I, I, how did that – what's this – so it's over 300 years old, I think, if I remember. 320 and change. Okay. okay. When, did, <laughs> when did that – instrument come into your life? What's, I'd love to know the story of that bass. Well, it came to just by chance. It's one of those pure luck things. I was soloing with a symphony in Uruguay, Montevideo. And this, uh, the principal bass comes and talks to me, look, there is this bass that I hear nobody wants. It's, it's a small body on the shape. It's like a bassetto. Uh, people here don't care about it. And it's been abandoned since the, the former owner for 25 years. And, and I knew the owner. He worked with my grandfather, the guy who brought it from uh, Italy uh, when the symphony was founded. His name was Battesini, not Bottesini. Okay. <laughs> Battesini. Uh, Giuseppe Battesini. He brought it and he worked, he worked with my grandfather. Said, oh, sure, no, who was the owner? Well, the widow kept it. They didn't want to sell it because... It was very loved by her husband. So when she died, the son who used to work with my father decided to sell it. And then he tried to sell it for many. I bought that instrument, love at first sight. It just, luckily to me, my wife was with me on the trip. I didn't have much money at the time to buy the instrument. We saw it and I said, I think this is a very nice old Italian instrument. So literally it was, I didn't know what I was buying. He didn't know what he was selling. I bought it without playing it. It was completely unglued. You couldn't, as soon as I start tuning up the pegs, gut strings on the instrument. Oh. Gut string, the instrument start opening up and splitting apart. It's a, that's it, that's it. <laughs> no, no one knows what I played on the instrument. 
And then I kept it in Georgia for a year until I took it to New York to have it repaired. And that's when the person told me, oh, I think this is a destroy. <laughs> and that's when my wife almost had to take me to the hospital five <laughs> minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> and then what obviously I, I followed it, the steps in Europe and confirmed that it was. Those are words that so many bass players wish that they could hear uttered. I think this is a uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my blood pressure went down. I turned white. My, my wife was doing dentistry in Boston at the time. And, and, and she came with me on that when I delivered the bass to have it repaired. And I had already told the gentleman, look, this is an instrument, it needs a lot of work, take your time. And I, I drove at his house and uh, dropped the instrument in his house, and his wife was there. I said, well, call me this number if you need any questions he knew about the instrument. And when I got to Boston, my wife's apartment, uh, it was already a message to call him right away. And that's when I thought he didn't want to do the job because too much work to do, you know, repairmen yeah. sometimes. If it's too much to do, they don't want to do it. I said, oh, no, I have another instrument. Take your time. I have another instrument that I'm using presently, so don't worry. If it takes one year, two years to fix it, it's okay. No, I didn't call you for that. And that's when he told me that he told me because he thought it was at the store. That's when my blood pressure went down and I almost said it in Massachusetts general. <laughs> But, but anyway, that's pure luck, is yeah. one of the things that happens. Isn't that a beautiful sound, the Testori bass? Oh, I could listen to that all day. Milton, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, there is a whole lot more from Milton, and we have links in the show notes. You can check out more of his playing, more of him. He's done several interviews. He's a very well-traveled and recognized musician and scholar and performer, as you can tell from this interview. So this is just scratching the surface with Milton. But I so appreciate you taking the time, Milton. It was great. We were chatting actually after one of the many hurricanes setting the scene here it is in late 2017 one of the many hurricanes that we've had this season had rolled through and had knocked out power for everywhere in his town except the university and we had the interview scheduled and I said Milton we could totally cancel obviously but he came into work and we chatted and it was such a thrill long overdue for sure Milton is one of those guests that I have had people request time and time again and sometimes it takes me a while to get to chat with people just through logistics or various circumstances. And I'm so glad to chat with Milton. And if you'd like to hear from a specific guest, even if I have interviewed them or especially if I haven't, let me know. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will put you in touch with me or about a specific topic. I've been trying to cover more people in different areas of the globe and in different genres going forward with the podcast. And I take every suggestion I get and I, I make a note of it. I have charts, I have spreadsheets, I have lists, and that's how I base who I contact next. And I think of this as a community Endeavor. I'm the one talking to you right now on my microphone here in San Francisco, but this is your podcast, okay? So get in touch with me and let me know what you would like to hear more of. That's how this show grows. And the other way this show grows is by spreading the word. And you might think that a lot of bass players listen to this, and a lot of bass players do listen to this. I'll tell you a little secret. But a lot of bass players don't. I would be flabbergasted if even 20% of the bass players out there in the world, that's probably a massively high number, have even listened to the show or heard of the show. So there is probably a bass player in your life that has not listen to the podcast. What are you waiting for? Let them know about the show. And by the way, as you can probably tell if you've listened to for any length of time, this show is 
kind of about the base, but it's kind of about life, mindset, getting better, lessons for younger folks. Uh, I, I, I like to think of it as a little bit broader than just talking about strings and standing versus sitting. Not that that's not important. It is. But I know that there's probably somebody, bass player or not, in your life that you could pass this along to. So you can forward this, send people an email. If you go to either the podcast app, ContrabassConversations.com slash app, or you go to our website, ContrabassConversations.com, or find us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, there is an option to share. And if you would not mind sharing on whatever social network you hang out on, or via email, or send someone a text message with a link, or the next time you're on a gig or you're in a teaching situation, turn and say, hey, check out ContrabassConversations.com slash Milton Mashadri or slash Caroline Emery or slash Gary Peacock or Gary Carr or whoever. I would so appreciate it. And I really appreciate you listening to this episode. And thanks for being on this journey with me. We will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 